Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Liana Lianoff, and I'm the uh, founder and president of the Global Positive Health Institute. And this is our podcast where we interview colleagues from around the world on all things related to positive health sciences, positive psychology, and health and healthcare. And today I'm delighted to have with us. Uh, Kieran O'Boyle, who is the founding director of the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland Center for Positive Health Sciences, uh, a new name. We love that name. Uh, so welcome, <laughs> Kieran. <laughs> Thanks very much, Lihara. <laughs> Good to be here. <laughs> And uh, and I just dive right in. We keep these short. Uh, what grabbed your attention to positive psychology and its impact on health and well-being? And how did you get involved? Well, thanks very much. I, it, it's sort of a roundabout way. When I started off my career, I'm towards the end of my career now. When I started back in, in 79, uh, I was working in a psychosomatic unit in a hospital. And we were dealing a lot with stress-related uh, disorders. And I got very interested in health psychology. I'm a pharmacologist and psychologist, but very interested in health psychology. So I set up a psychology department in the RCSI. We we have very large medical schools in a number of, of countries. And I set up a health psychology department and ran that for, for many years. And then I set up an institute of leadership. And it was there I first came across positive organizational scholarship. So we were teaching leadership to health professionals and we settled on a type of leadership called transformational leadership, mm -hmm. which really is about building trust and working to make the situation as good as it can possibly be for the people reporting into you. And that's really when I started to hear about positive organizational scholarship, uh, the work of the University of Michigan, people like Kim Cameron, Bob Quinn. That brought me around to Marty Seligman and Mike Cheek sent me high. And I had read Seligman back in 79 on learned helplessness. So I, I had an idea who, who Marty was. So that got myself and a few other people in, in our CSI asking the question, well, you know, this is relevant not just for creating positive organizations. It's relevant for, you know, the, the whole healthcare spectrum of healthcare thinking and interventions. So we, we discussed that for a number of years, really. And then we decided we would set up a center and we set it up as a center for positive psychology and health in the first instance. And then we learned very quickly that that wasn't really broad enough. We discovered then the work of people like yourself in the lifestyle medicine, Beth Freitas and, and others. And we said we, we would change that to a center for positive health sciences. And that's how we've got to where we are at today. Yeah, no, it, and we're still struggling with the with the term positive health, as you and I have chatted uh, in the past, and and that will evolve over uh, the years. Uh, but uh, I I agree, and uh, that we're looking at something more broad. Positive psychology is an important piece, but there are these other elements of healthy lifestyles and a comprehensive healthy lifestyle, holistic medicine that fits yeah. very well uh, with lifestyle medicine and. And also person-centered care. Uh, so, so I, I think that uh, I hope that positive health will become a standard term for us that means all of that. And um, yeah, I, 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 I'm very influenced by Antonovsky, as I think you are as well, by salutogenesis. This idea that we know an awful lot about disease, and we know much less about health and well-being. So, our our interest. In a, we're just publishing a book this year, uh, which of course you're you're a co-editor on on the uh, the International Handbook of Positive Health, and it has taken us a long time to work out what we mean by positive health. And I think broadly we're saying well it's a destination, so we've got disease and serious illness, and perhaps death at one end of a spectrum, and we're thriving at the other end. Positive health is something to do with that psychological, physical, spiritual, emotional, meaningful thriving. But the problem with just talking about it as an end point is that that doesn't really cover it because it's also a journey. So anyone on that trajectory, even somebody who's unwell, if they improve, well, that's part of a positive health journey. So it, it's been really interesting, I think, when you start to unpack this, how difficult it is to tie down precisely uh, what we mean by positive health in a way that's comprehensive. And the other thing I'd say about that is I think for all of us in this space, 
it is absolutely essential that we base it, the foundations are scientific disciplines, that there's a research base. So I think that's positive psychology, health psychology, lifestyle medicine, personalized medicine, and so on. But the, the wellness industry is so enormous and so bereft in many ways of, of, of evidence that I think for us in the in academia and in, in the in the medical universities, you know, our, our foundational base must be research, must be evidence. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that's uh, also what uh, I've been. On uh, in these spheres of the social sciences, positive psychology, health psychology, um, and we also need to not only continue that, but start to translate that into more traditional healthcare settings, lifestyle medicine settings, healthcare uh, <clears throat> settings, and um, and there's so much more research to be done there. In fact, we probably really haven't begun in that realm, and yeah. uh, hopefully, uh, colleagues who are listening to podcasts like this and the work that you're doing at RCSI and that we're doing uh, will uh, inspire uh, folks to, to jump in and see what we can do uh, uh, for our collective uh, well-being actually is more the, the term that we're using as to, opposed to wellness that's scientifically based. Um, but terminology will always be a little bit of a thorn in our side, unfortunately. <laughs> and it's evolving. I think it, yes. that's... Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about how you use this science in your personal life. Well, a couple of things really, and it's a, again, it's an evolution. Uh, it's a journey. I I wish I'd known some of this when I was much younger. <laughs> and one of the things I found really useful for myself and also when I'm teaching, you know, in, in corporate situations, teaching leadership, think, teaching medical students, I, I think the strengths-based research in positive psychology is very solid. Uh, I think this notion of doing a paradigm shift, everyone's aware of their vulnerabilities, I think, but a lot of us aren't really aware of our strengths. So I found it personally very helpful to actually go and do some of the strengths questionnaire, especially the VIA, the VIA Character Strengths Inventory. And I, I roughly knew what some of my strengths were, but I was a bit surprised at, you know, what came out as my number one, which was curiosity and, and love of learning. So I found that very helpful. And it also helped me to start to explain uh, to others this idea of having a, a mindset shift from focusing on the negatives, which Roy Baumaster and people have shown we, we tend to be hardwired for, to now focusing on our strengths. So, so that was one thing. Uh, I think exercise was the other, you know, kind of building much more physical activity, including isometric uh, activity. And then for me, uh, the microbiome. Uh, I think the research on the microbiome, I find amazing. Because being both a psychologist and a pharmacologist, I'm very surprised because, you know, if I go back to the late 70s when we were working with patients, we had no idea about these mechanisms. We knew there were biopsychological mechanisms that were important, but we didn't know what they were. We only had the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. That was pretty much it, to be honest, yeah. you know? Yeah. Whereas now you see, you know, heart rate variability, you see the microbiome, you see psychoneuroimmunology. We're starting to put back together what Descartes pulled apart, you know? And so this idea that a human is a, is a system, a really complex system, you know, I have, so one of the things for me that I have found is shifting much more to a vegetarian, you know, type diet in the last couple of years since I learned about the microbiome. I, I have found that bit very, very useful. I'm continuing on that trajectory. It, it also raises the question, and in, in a lot of our medical schools, we've been very slow to, uh, you know, integrate, uh, you know, training and education on nutrition. For, for young medical students and nursing students. And that's a massive gap uh, in our education system, increasingly, increasingly, obviously so. Yes, uh, you've, you've hit on some major pillars of a healthy lifestyle uh, yeah. that uh, they all uh, interrelate with each other and reinforce each other. Uh, and then positive psychology, positive activities, positive emotions reinforce those activities and vice versa, that doing those activities improves our emotional, mental health and uh, having that 
comprehensive, holistic approach makes a lot of sense. So you discovered it for yourself, and I'm glad you're taking. Uh, well, I, I have to. I have to give it. some credit to to you and and others in the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. I think that's a very elegant. Uh, model the six pillars model and your own work in integrating positive psychology into that and also defining the competencies uh, in lifestyle medicine I think that's a really useful framework for everybody interested in in this space yeah it it helps to uh, uh, it's it's a complex area but to at least have a starting point uh, yeah. a, a solid framework from yeah. which we can we can build um, so. yeah Absolutely. And so for listeners to this podcast who might not be familiar with this, or they're just learning about positive psychology, positive health, lifestyle medicine, and they're thinking about implementing that for themselves, and certainly uh, maybe in their clinical practices, that's part of what I'm always thinking about is what advice would we be giving them? Where Where is a good starting point? What, what are your thoughts? on that? Well, we've done a lot of work on this with our own colleagues here in the medical profession, nursing professions, and so on, especially during COVID. I, I think COVID has been a real accelerator for thinking about this, but we know a lot of our colleagues in the healthcare disciplines are finding life very difficult and very challenging. There's a great deal of stress, burnout, and so on there. And it, it's it's really, it's very concerning. So uh, when I speak to, when I speak to uh, colleagues the various disciplines, there has to be a win for themselves personally, I think. It's not just about their patients. So I, I'm very interested in this idea of putting on your own oxygen mask first, you know, that there are good reasons why health professionals need to look after their own health, not least of which is an ethical reason, because, you know, looking after others, you, you've got to be able to look after yourself to, to do that well. So a couple of things. I, I think that the the training that we have up to now really pushes people, you know, in these disciplines to kind of self-sacrifice. I, I don't think there's a great deal of self-compassion uh, in the in the professions. And I think that's something that we like to talk about. It's very difficult to be compassionate to others without being compassionate for yourself. So Neff's work, for example, on self-compassion, I think that's a good starting point. I think the strengths area is a very good starting point. I get people to go on to via, do the question. And that, that's a kind of a mindset shift. Uh, I and my colleagues, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Patrick Dunn in our center, who has done a great deal of work with health professionals on mindful meditation, uh, you know, attention. I, I think that's important. And I think that's a way of starting to pull back and take take the time. The, the challenge, of course, is that all health professionals, I think, know pretty much what they should be doing. The challenge is to actually do it. And that's often a time management uh, issue. So I often get people to look at Stephen Covey's work, you know, the seven habits of highly effective people and the time management systems into that, particularly that quadrant that he talks about of doing important things that aren't urgent. Those are the things we have to act on. And I think for our colleagues, that's the box that's very hard to act on because the urgent stuff takes up all of their time. So that reformulating thinking about time in terms of a focusing in at least some time on that, you know, uh, important non-urgent box. And then also maybe thinking less about managing time, more about managing energy. I, I think those are the kinds of starting points. I also think the trans theoretical model of change is very important because, yeah. you know, that pre-contemplation phase that many people might be at, shifting from that into a contemplation phase and then from that into preparing phase is, is so knowing where you are on that trajectory, I think is really very helpful. Yeah, yeah, well, wonderful advice. Uh, it's it's very concrete starting point, starting with yourself, mm -hmm. and what are those concrete steps you can take one after the other to build on um, uh, what can really support you first, as they say, put on your own oxygen mask <laughs> first. Yeah. And, and, and Ileana, we've been very surprised. We run a we set up a professional diploma in positive health three years ago. And, you know, it's knowledge based with written assignments and so on. But we built in uh, a, an assignment that runs throughout the year for uh, for scholars doing that program, who are all health professionals, by the way. And that is they have to assess their own health and well-being in a variety with using a variety of measures, come up with a plan, implement the plan, 
and the assignments for the various modules, part of the assignment is their assessment of where they've got to, what the barriers were and so on. And they have to retrospectively assess that at the end of the program. And that has been the biggest impact of that program for many of those professionals. And a lot of them would say that they have changed dramatically across the period of the year of that program. And we weren't expecting that to have such an impact. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. And uh, uh, w everything that uh, we do at the Global Cause of Health Institute is with first starting with yourself and, and yeah. then learning to apply it. And uh, of course, the College of American College of Lifestyle Medicine has a wonderful physician health professional well-being program as well. That's Absolutely. pulling yeah. all of that together <clears throat> as well. Um, lots of lessons learned there and so much more to be done there as well. Yes, yes. Uh, and so speaking of lots of work that uh, you're doing at RCSI and that we're doing at GPHI and American College of Lifestyle Medicine, if we succeed in integrating what we've been talking about into health care and medicine and beyond, society and beyond, what would that wonderful future look like? Uh, when, when will we know that we've really succeeded? I, I think we will know when we when we when we go up the river and see what's pushing people in to use Aaron Antonovsky's model, you know, when we've got a healthcare system that yes, course continues to treat people who have serious acute and chronic conditions, but in addition and almost at the same scale, we are able to go up the river and start to look at really preventing these kinds of conditions. And I think a large part of that some of that is to do with personal empowerment and changes in the paradigm, but a great deal of that will be integrating public health, which I know you're an expert on, public health system, policy systems. So when I think about this, I think about scaling in a number of ways. One is that clearly we have to change how we educate young doctors, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists, and so on. Uh, so the educate healthcare education itself I think we have to educate the public. We have to make available far more information that's solidly based uh, to the public. I think our our education system, you know, getting getting education to young children. I'm talking about four or five years of age now, starting there. And I've seen this being done in Victoria, for example, Australia, uh, with keep teaching children about their strengths. You know, starting to help kids understand, you know, the power they have over their own health. And then I think the organizations you know in the private sector public sector you know the ngos and so on and that's more complex because i think that's not just a matter of hr departments having programs although that's that's valuable i think that's a matter of the whole culture of organizations so it's the c-suite down it's how you create cultures in organizations where people flourish so when i think about that they're my they're my sort of roots to scaling this kind of of thinking uh, but the outcome, I think, will be if we start to see the, the prevention, the preventative efforts starting to impact uh, on the numbers and the numbers, the, the incidence and the prevalence, particularly of the non-communicable diseases, starting to, to drop. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. And thank you for really uh, emphasizing also the role of what I call the culture of well-being in organizations and a great place to start is in our healthcare organizations. And in fact, yeah. when we teach provider professional well-being, uh, we absolutely acknowledge that it's a marriage between what you do for yourself, but also uh, having some leadership and working to promote that culture of well-being in, in the place you work, where you spend so many hours. And uh, uh, we have a long, long ways to, to go to-, to and it, It's a real challenge that because you know you really need people it's it's a combination of well-being theory and science but also with leadership and management skills so there's a kind of a whole new sort of interface that has to be developed there but i i, I honestly don't think it's it's that difficult because you know if we look at you know self-determination theory we know humans have three basic needs you know we have a need for autonomy you know we have a need for competence and we have a need for relatedness and any any good organization who can meet those needs of their people in the workplace will have healthy, well, uh, peop staff. You know, so I think we've overcomplicated all of that. I think we just need to bring that back to basics. And transformational leadership is an excellent model, I think, in that space. 
Well said. So as we're talking about making this kind of progress, what do you see as our greatest challenge in really fully implementing positive health in healthcare uh, and in our society? Yeah, I to be honest with you, you know, I think our greatest challenge is still the biomedical model. <laughs> I, there's been a lot written right back from Engel in the 70s about the biopsychosocial model and so on. But I, I still think the biomedical model is so deeply ingrained, particularly in Western culture, yeah. you know, and I think it's very ingrained still in our in our medical nursing education systems. I, I, so I, I think that's the biggest challenge is getting the paradigm shift. I think that still hasn't, to be honest, I don't think that's really happened. I think that's one challenge. I, I personally think there are a lot of vested interests, uh, you know, who would, which would like to see the current situation uh, continue. And it's pretty obvious where, where those vested interests lie. Uh, I think there's huge work to be done with the uh, food industry, uh, for example, with the drinks industry, with these, ma ma with with the healthcare industry uh, itself, with the insurance. There's there's a whole lot of of work to be done there at a sort of a strategic and at a policy and at a, at a procedural uh, level. So I I think the challenges are to do with societal and con construction of what we mean in the first place by health and healthcare. Yeah. That's that's the basic challenge that I see there. And that will take a long time. And that that's so fundamental and so huge. It's <laughs> so, enormous. So it's well, enormous. Well yeah. said. Uh, I mean, a, a shift and related to that is we talked about earlier how everything that we do, we want to be science based um, and uh, mm -hmm. we're promoting research. Is there a research question that you think uh, in your mind rises to the top that will help us propel this work forward that will really be, um, you know, monumental and getting people's attention? I, I do. I, I, I do actually think there is one. And that is, you see, I think when, when we think about positive health, we go back to that spectrum or that continuum from zero to minus 10 being the disease uh, trajectory. All of our research practically, you know, in the biomedical sciences is in that space. And that's fantastic. We learn a huge amount. Look at genomics, for example, you know, microbiome and so on. But if we look at the zero to plus 10 space, I think we know very little really about the, the physiology, you know, the, 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 the biophysiology, psychophysiology, psychoneuroimmunology of that space. And I'm, I'm with people like Carl Riff who would say, the, the biology of that is not just the obverse or the mirror image of the biology of the of the other side. So if we take, for example, Barb Friedrichson's broaden and build theory, that's an example of a model which shows that if we're experiencing positive emotions, we th there's a neurological shift to the way we process information. I think we have a lot of, we, we, we know practically nothing at this point about research in that space. Yeah. And that seems to me to be the space that we need to really start to dig into. If we start to establish what the mechanisms are here on this positive end of that spectrum, that I think will start to to shift uh, to shift the the dynamic and shift the conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, you know. Those of us who are thinking in the space, writing in the space, uh, you you look at the literature and the science that's available, and there's a paucity of uh, the science that's really addressing what what's happening here, physiologically, psychologically, in, in doing positive interventions, yeah. and uh, uh, so. Uh, we have a long ways to go. <laughs> but, it, but it's exciting because, yes. uh, you know, we know that there are biological mechanisms, psychological, psychological, and genomic mechanisms here, but we don't know what they are. Yeah. And I, I, we're starting to get glimmers of that, I think. Yeah. But I, I think that's an enormously exciting new horizon in research here. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So speaking of uh, resources, uh, we we have what we have to date as we move uh, forward to a brighter future. Uh, what are some of your favorite resources that, that you might recommend to our listeners who want to learn more about this field? 
Well, I, I think that the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has done a great job. And there are other uh, lifestyle medicine organizations now emerging. But I've been particularly impressed with the American College of Lifestyle. And I know you've done a lot of pioneering work on that, Leanna. But I find those resources tremendous because it gives me the science. It gives me the evidence. So that's that's one. Uh, I think via character.org, uh, Ryan Nimick's uh, group in, in uh, Cincinnati, I need a wonderful research base again to that strength based uh, work. I, I, I bring a lot of people back to John Kabat-Zinn, you know, and mindfulness-based stress reduction, the kind of integration of mindfulness meditation there. I, I think that's a that's a tremendous uh, resource. And then for the corporate sector, for me, it's hard to beat the University of Michigan, the Center for Positive Organization Scholarship there. The appreciative inquiry folks, I think their, their work is beautiful in terms of giving us a whole new type of research methodology uh, that helps us to to look at how organizations will be will be structured and if if we can be if i can be very cheeky i would recommend our coming book the, the international handbook of positive health so we, we have gone to a lot of great authors yes. around the world to actually pull people in i think who have made wonderful contributions to that to try to start to build that as a as a as a as a coherent science yeah i i agree that we uh, it's very exciting that we were able to to pull together some some key uh thought yeah. leaders in this area and come together on that so that'll be very exciting so thanks for that plug <laughs> uh so as we wrap up this podcast any words of wisdom uh, in terms of, is there one take home that we all need to be thinking about in the space of positive health and well-being? Yeah, for me, it is, you know, we're, we're not saying when we talk up to positive health that negative events, you know, and being ill and so on aren't relevant. They're highly relevant. I think that was a mistake that positive psychology made at the start. It kind of was all focused on the positive to the exclusion. We can learn a great deal through adversity and negative events so but i think for me the main message is is really that there's a great deal we can do ourselves to help ourselves psychologically physically in terms of spirituality in terms of meaning and so on and and you know it's like that old chinese saying you know the longest journey starts with the first step so any change any small change it doesn't have to be climbing a mountain any small change is good is positive that would be my major take home just start somewhere start small and make the small change and then do something else and it doesn't have to be a, a sort of a massive stressor just start doing small things that for me is the key take on message in this space small steps build self-efficacy we teach that behavior change yes. all the time yes. so i i totally resonate with that yeah, yeah. So, well wonderful any last thoughts as we wrap up I, I think for me, what 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 one of the things that, that I feel very strongly about is looking at this epidemic of mental health issues in young people, in our country, in Ireland, in Britain, in the United States. Vikram Murthy, the, the Surgeon General, has written an advisory about this. So we are seeing the next generation coming along having huge problems in the mental health arena. Some of that is to do with technology. I, I think they've been described as the most connected but the loneliest generation uh, in history. For me, my final thoughts are we, we need to really start getting in there and starting to help to prevent that epidemic of mental health. And I think positive psychology, positive education allows us to actually start intervening very early there. And for future generations, that is absolutely vital. Yeah, it opens the doors for a different yeah. life, uh, living a different life. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Karen O'Boyle. It's been wonderful. Hopefully we may bring you back some other time uh, to continue this conversation. And thank you to our listeners for this GPHI podcast. Uh, I will hope to see you on another one of these in the future. And please subscribe to our channel. Take care. Be safe. Be well. Be happy. Until next time. Bye-bye, everyone.